So now without further ado, it's my pleasure to start today's session by introducing our first speaker, Jesse Peretz, Director with Ipsos's Affluent Intelligence Team. Jesse, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Jesse with my colleague Stephen. We'll be uh, taking you through some of the uh, financial um, affluent look, outlook on financials. Um, if you want to move on. Um, so the data we're presenting today will come from two two sources. It's the uh, fall 2022 affluent survey release. Um, as well as our Q1 barometer that was fielded in early January this year. Um, the, today we're going to start by giving you a picture of what um, have what investors look like and how they approach their finances. From there, we're going to talk about the financial outlook in the coming year, including how affluence will change their investment approaches. I will uh, guide you through um, affluent retirement and how that looks and then Stephen will take over and walk you through the financial institutions and professionals as well as the generational differences we see in their approach to finance. Um, so we've seen a bunch of turmoil in the last couple of years obviously um, and the events of the last few weeks bring some uncertainty to the marketplace with that in mind we're going to go through. Um, according to the Federal Reserve Board Affluence have seen a decline in net worth in the past uh, couple quarters. Um, this isn't all things to worry about, but we are noticing this in our data as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, looking through our own data, you can see that now we have one in five affluence basically saying that their net worth decreased in 2022. That's about four times higher than it was in 2022, looking at 2021. Uh, three and four affluents are saying their finances have improved in the past year. Um, when we asked this question last year, that was about 90%. So we're, we're seeing a little bit of a shift in how that goes. Um, only 24% believe their investments will grow significantly in 2023. Uh, next, one in five affluents are anticipating their finances to be worse in the next six months than they are now. Um, while there are more affluents who anticipate their finances improving, we do are seeing a shift in that people are thinking that their finances are going to get worse. Uh, if you go to the next slide, the biggest fear and the reason for this is the inflation. 64% of affluents believe that rising inflation is going to impact their finances, and inflation's been at 40-year highs, um, so it makes sense that this is kind of their main fear. Um, when we look at the rest of the things that we think are going to affect their finances in 23, um, as you can see, inflation is the biggest number, but uh, recession has doubled in the past year as a concern. Obviously, the coronavirus pandemic has uh, it gone down, had a significant drop in the past year uh, with people kind of moving towards a post-COVID landscape. Um, high inflation, we're seeing about a 6.4% year-over-year increase. That was what the January number was. Uh, it's quite a bit down from last summer when it peaked around 9% inflation. Uh, there was a decline from December's 6.5% rate, so hopefully we're going to continue seeing that downward trend uh, when we get the February data. Uh, currently, inflation is affecting almost all categories of um, goods that people purchase. Um, the only one that's really you know, seeing a decline in inflation is used cars and trucks, and that's due to um, a kind of increased price on those due to a chip shortage for new cars in the last year that we've moved past, so now the used car prices are starting to slide back down. Um, when we look at 
how the Dow Jones has reacted since in 2022. You can see that you know it's down one percent year over year, but it's basically flat in the end. But there were significant drops during their um, affluence are twice as likely than non affluence to say they are financially secure and 72% say they still have money left over for a little indulgence. With this in mind, you know, when we look at how affluent optimism is going, um, you can see that it's kind of even right now, 41% pessimistic, 40% optimistic. Affluents are always the first group to overcome financial hard obstacles like inflation or a recession. Historically, our optimism has been pretty tied to how the stock market looks because affluent money is taking up a great deal of the stock market money. Um, that's why you know, the net worth is down. It's not that their wages or anything has gone down in the last year. It's just that because the stock market went down for a bit, their optimism about the economy went down. Now that the stock market's kind of going back up, their optimism is going back up. Um, we'll see if this continues in the next few months. Um, when we look at their concerns for the next coming year, or when we look at how they think the coming year is going to go, you can see here that the things that are within their control, how their family is, the company they work for, if it'll be a good year for them personally, and their career finances, there's a lot more optimism than the economy generally or America as a whole. Uh, this is something that we notice every year with affluent data. They are very insulated against the rest of the country and how the economy is moving. Uh, and then when we look at how spending is going to go in 2023 you can see here that for all the kind of you know household things grocery streaming cable uh, technology the numbers have gone down a little bit from 2021 and we've seen increases in cars vacations personal services commuting etc anything that somebody is going to need to go out into the world is really starting to increase and with that, I will hand it over to Steve to discuss the Heflin portfolio. Thank you, Jesse. So let's go over the Heflin financial portfolio. How much money do they have, investments, and what they plan to do in the future? There are over 33 million households in the U.S. that we classify as affluence. The median average affluent household has a net worth of $1.25 million. Over one in four of these households, these 33 million households, has a net worth of excess of 2.5 million or more. And one in seven, 14% of them have 5 million or more in net worth. On average, affluent households have about three quarters of a million dollars in investable assets. And as a result, they are critical to the financial institutions of every kind. <clears throat> the older affluents, the more established affluents, have the greatest holdings. But even younger, younger generations, the Gen Z, the millennials, they're building a significant amount of wealth, which will grow as their earning power increases over time. But establishing financial strength requires dedication, commitment, and in many cases, financial professionals and advisors, which we will go through later on in this, uh, this presentation. So let's take a deeper look at the overall affluent portfolio. Jesse talked earlier about the loss of net worth among affluents. While that may seem like a big concern, we know that about half of affluents have their investments locked up in stocks and funds. This is where most of the losses of net worth occurred <clears throat> due to inflation and the recession. So even when they are losing net worth, it does not affect their day-to-day -day life. They could sit on these investments and wait for them to go back up. And judging by the Dow Jones slide Jesse showed earlier and the increase in optimism, we know that this loss is just temporary, especially among affluents who are always the first group to rebound over any financial hiccups. And this chart shows affluence allocations among different types of financial accounts uh, over the years. And it's relatively stable in the, in the past five or six years. We've seen little movement in where they place their financial bets. They clearly look to have diversification as a means to balance growth with safer investments to hedge against market changes. 
Uh, the upper there in the in the other securities, the twelve percent, three percent are actually of cryptocurrency. Three percent of the share of affluence portfolio is cryptocurrency. So I wanted to touch touch base and look a little deeper into the the crypto market. So we know that crypto has experienced significant losses in 2022. So let's talk a little bit about why that is. FTX, one of the major crypto exchanges, has faced an almost collapse in recent months. On top of that, their CEO is under indictment for fraud. And another reason is the rise in fees. Due to inflation that we, uh, we discussed earlier and other factors that have impacted the crypto market, many of the crypto services were forced to increase their fees in order to keep their head above water. And these extra fees have turned off many buyers. And of course, Bitcoin, the largest cryptocurrency, has seen a steady decline from an all-time high in $68,000 um, in November of 2021, remember those good old days, to where it is now. It's hovering around $25,000. It's a drastic decline. And as Bitcoin goes, so does the rest of the crypto market. But there is hope. Uh, Bitcoin bottomed out, um, out around 15K in November of 2022. So just a few months ago, it was at 15K. And now it's currently floating around 25,000. So there is uh, room, there's some, some hope for that it'll slowly climb back up to the all-time high. And the last one is us on speculation and manipulation. So when investors, especially whales, these are the ones that hold a, a, a majority or a lot of shares in these, uh, these crypto market uh, cur currencies, when they, share, when they sell their assets in droves, either out of fear or panic, or just to manipulate the market, when you sell, you know, it'll go down and you buy when it's lower and hoping it'll, it'll go back up, that's called manipulating the market. It causes the entire crypto market to plunge and everybody else, the, 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 smaller, uh, the smaller owners, they all have to suffer from it too. And this drop in cryptocurrency, uh, it's no different among affluents. At its peak, 41% of affluents owned some form of cryptocurrency in early 2022. And it's dropped to 33% ownership in 2023. But all is not lost. Eight in 10 crypto owners plan to invest more or the same as in previous years, with 35% planning to invest more. And this may be lower than a, a year ago's uh, percentages, but this shows that affluents are not ready to dump all their crypto assets and still have hope that they will go back to the glory days of 2021. In fact, some affluents still find cryptocurrency a better investment than stocks. This is especially true with the younger affluents as 40% of Gen Z or millennial affluents agree with this statement compared to 20% of total affluence. So double the amount for the younger affluents. So let's continue to track this movement in the coming months, see if Bitcoin recovers, see if all the cryptocurrencies start to, start to spike back up. <clears throat> so how will all of this play out for 2023? You know, with all the worries about inflation and the economy and cryptocurrency, affluence will be slightly more conservative and less aggressive with their investments this year. If you look at the numbers, 2022, 23% of them say they, they plan to be more aggressive compared to 18%, so a 5% uh, drop in aggressiveness. And having said all that, what does the future hold? Many affluents still plan to hire a financial professional, acquire new insurance, and open new financial accounts. These have all shown increases from pre-pandemic levels in 2020. So despite, or should I say because of worries about the inflation and the economy, affluents are starting to look for ways to better their finances by either getting guidance or moving their investments around to maximize their profitability. Now, with that great news, I'll pass it back to Jesse to talk in detail about the retirement category. Thanks, Steve. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so, when we look at the employed affluence right now, uh, in the next 10 years, we're going to see a big shift. Um, most of the affluent boom, baby boomers are going to retire. That's uh, about 75% of the, the remaining employed ones are going to retire. Um, but we're also seeing a sort of Gen X reaching retirement age. Um, Gen X makes about up about 35% of the affluent population right now. It's our 
largest generation within the affluence. Um, and 20% are planning to retire in the next 10 years with 46% getting ready to retire within the next 20. Um, obviously, the Gen Z and millennials are a ways off from their retirement, although 10% you know, think that they can do it in the next 10 years. Um, when we go to the expectations for how much money is needed for retirement in 2019, that was sitting at about $1.9 million. And now that's raised up to uh, $2.4 million. When we look at this broken out by generations, you really see a sh where this is coming from. Um, the boomers and seniors think they need about 1.8 million to retire, Gen X, which is in line with where that was in you know, 2019, Gen X is about 2.3 million, and then Gen Z and Millennials think they'll need nearly $3 million to retire, and that will probably go up between now and when they hit retirement age. Um, next, 401ks remain the most popular retirement account. 75% uh, of employed affluents own a 401k account, uh, but we're seeing generational differences in how uh, retirement accounts are kind of spread out. Uh, the boomers are most likely to own regular and spousal IRAs as well as annuities and brokerage accounts. Gen Xers are the most likely to own 401ks and Roth IRAs. Um, and interestingly, the younger affluents are the least likely to have a 401k and that, and they seem to have more of the simple 401ks and simple IRAs, as well as the Keo and 457B accounts. These are all accounts that are focused on smaller companies. So we know that with them working more in startups and entrepreneurial pursuits, that will make a lot of sense. Um, the retirement contributions are shifting a little bit, um, or they shifted a little bit during the pandemic, and now they're shifting back. Um, we're seeing that instead of contributing, you know, in that more than the company match and less than the maximum range, uh, affluence are shifting more towards the maximum allowed or the company match levels. Um, when we look at this generationally, generationally, the younger generations are more likely to just do the company match as they need their money for the rest of their livelihoods. Um, versus, you know, the older generations, Gen Xers and baby boomers are put about half of Gen Xers and more than 60% of baby boomers are putting in the maximum allowable for their age as they get closer to retirement. Um, during the pandemic, a lot of companies stopped offering matching retirement account matching as part of, you know, cost saving measures. So we've seen that, you know, company not offering matching contributions uh, shrink as those policies have gone back into place. Um, next, affluence are on track to be financially prepared for retirement. 62% um, say they've exceeded their financial goals for retirement or are on track for them. That number is about 75% for baby boomers and um, about 40% of Gen Xers say they're at least somewhat behind on their retirement planning goals. Um, when we look at how they plan for retirement, affluent boomers are the most likely to use the traditional sources like you know recommendations and traditional media. Gen X is using the same types of sources, though at small, lower levels. Um, the younger generations are using, you know, more non-traditional sources, but they're also in such early stages that, you know, they will get moved as they near actual retirement. Um, we're seeing across the board increases in what professionals are being used in retirement planning. There's you know, a big increase in full service brokers and financial planners and online trading. It's just across the board, if um, you're planning for retirement, you are using professionals to help. Uh, 
in the midst of asking all of our, you know, kind of dry questions. We do ask people what they're looking forward to in retirement. Um, we haven't seen a lot of shifts in the past four years from when we started asking this question, but the largest shift is actually in travel, where it dropped nine points over that time. Um, it's still the thing that people are most looking forward to. Um, and it seems a little odd with, you know, a lot of the pent up wanderlust that we're seeing in the rest of our research right now. But it's this is being driven mostly by younger generations who are, you know, maybe not waiting to retirement to travel and they want to get it done now. Um, the on the flip side, we do ask about their concerns. For retired life and while they've remained mostly consistent over that time we're seeing decreases on the kind of financial uh, measures while the more personal fears like the losing independence uh, and lack of um, sorry losing the independence and volatility in the stock market are rising um, it's really a matter of uh, what's going on now versus how they feel kind of what's going to happen in the future. Um, affluents are really looking forward to their retirement. Uh, we've seen a huge increase um, in the thought that it will be better than it is now. Uh, this is being driven by the younger generations, more than half of whom say that retirement will be better than their lives are now. Um, about 60% of baby boomers and Gen Xers think it'll remain about the same. Um, and with that, we asked a few questions to people who are planning to retire, you know, about what they think. And what we come up with is here you're seeing that the younger generations are likely to say that retiring younger is more important to them than the you know, Gen Xers and the baby boomers for whom you know, that ship has sailed at this point for retiring as young as they can. Um, when we ask them if they want to retire full time or work, we saw a big shift from 2019 where you know half the affluents who were planning to retire said they would still want to work part time, and now that number is down below 40 percent. Um, people are really just want to get out of the workforce when they are done. Um, affluents aren't planning to change too much in retirement. Uh, most affluents think they'll be more of themselves in retirement. Uh, obviously, this you can see the shift on the generations again, where the uh, Gen Z and Millennials will probably reinvent themselves a few more times before they get to retirement anyway. Um, the younger generations are less interested in saving. Um, while most affluents are erring on the side of saving for the future, Given how far the younger generations are, it makes sense that they're trying to spend their money. That's kind of where those like uh, looking forward to traveling goes away because they're using their money now. Um, and then when we look at leaving money to their heirs, you can see that there's a big difference between the Gen Z millennials and the boomers. Um, most Affluents are trying to enjoy their own money while they're still alive, but that kind of goes down as you get younger. Um, and then affluents are becoming more active in their handling of their retirement portfolios. You can see here that the set it and forget it people have you know, dropped 15% over the past four years. Um, with that, we're going to take a look at what actual retirement looks like for affluence. Retirees make about 14% of the affluent population. Our survey qualifies people on household income. So while they're, so these are people who are still earning $125,000 or more in a year, even despite being retired, that could be through their own savings. This is a population that has you know, a bit more than $2 million in median net worth, which is about 60% higher than the average affluent. Um, 
And that could be where the money is coming from. It could also be another, their partner or spouse is still working. Um, we've seen a slight dip in the past four years on the number of affluent retirees who say they reached or exceeded their financial goals for retirement. Um, the more recent retirees are kind of on the, uh, they reached their goals, but they hadn't exceeded it during the pandemic. There was a lot of people who um, were either let go early and just went into retirement or you know, took a buyout recently. Um, in the past 10 years, you can see that there's been a shift here um, between the people who've retired in the past 10 years and the retired more than 10 years ago, that the financial goals in reaching them early isn't happening at the same rate. Um, other reasons here also included, you know, illness, job elimination, buyouts, et cetera. Uh, Affluents are, aren't making as many changes to their portfolios, um, but really the thing that happens most is that their investments go into more conservative kind of accounts. Um, it's that that's really where you know once you're retired you can't afford to have you know high risk investments as much anymore uh, but they are using the financial professionals and almost across the board when you look at this we ask the question of you know who did you use for in retirement and who are you continuing to use those continuing to use numbers are higher almost across the board and we kind of see that yeah once they retire they might be set in who they're using or a company but they are adding more help to their financial uh, portfolio uh, next but staff was are were financially prepared for retirement as you can see here yeah for the most part, budgets have remained the same. And then there was a shift in 2021 to loosen their budgets a little bit. This could have happened with the um, the government sending out checks during COVID. Um, and with those no longer going out, the, you know, the loosened number is back kind of towards normal as well as the tightened and the remain the same is stable. When we look at how retirement is for them. You see that the better than expected number has dropped a lot since, you know, pre and during the pandemic, especially during the pandemic. I think a lot of the retirees were just happy not to be dealing with the issues of people, the issues of the employed people who were trying to adjust for working through a pandemic. So that certainly would have made retirement seem a lot better. Um, and then one final point on affluent retirees, they use a, re they used a great uh, variety of resources in preparing their retirement planning. Um, mostly, you know, a lot of people want to get their personalized recommendations, especially from their financial advisors and insurance reps. Um, when we look at the data versus four years ago, there's not huge shifts happening, but we are seeing things kind of going more towards the new online sources and stuff. And that's with the yeah, younger baby boomers, older Gen Xers kind of moving into retirement age. Uh, and with that, I will hand it back to Steve. Thank you, Jesse. And with retirement looming among so many affluents, let's turn our attention to the needs for financial professionals. I know Jesse uh, touched a little bit about that, but let's just uh, dive a little deeper into that, uh, that category. About two in five affluents are currently looking for professional financial advice, and over half prefer these professionals to handle all their finances. They'd rather not be so involved and want to trust these, these advisors. We'll touch more a, a little later on this trust in the presentation. And these numbers are significantly higher among millennials. 
These young affluents have just started their financial journey and are looking for experts to handle their ever-growing finances. And this chart here, it's mostly showing the expected churn of financial professionals used by affluents. The survey was filled in early January, so it makes sense to see the seasonal growth uh, the tax, during tax season of tax consultants and CPAs. But at the top of the list is the do-it-yourself usage of online trading for their stocks and crypto buys. The usage of a robo-advisor is at the bottom of the list, but this is a service that is starting to gain some traction. So let's talk a little bit more about this robo-advisors. Familiarity of these robo-advisors have more than tripled in the last few years, and usage has increased 2.5 times. It's currently at 15%. But affluents still prefer human financial experts rather than a robo-advisor, so don't expect human professionals to be replaced anytime soon. Millennials, however, tend to trust robo-advisors at a much higher rate. In fact, 37% of millennials say they trust data algorithms more than human judgment, compared to only 28% only of total affluents. And when deciding on financial advisors, affluents tend to lean most heavily on personal recommendations, whether it's from a professional advisor, friends or family, or industry experts. Website articles are also a very popular source when making a decision on who to hire. <clears throat> Trustworthiness remains a top factor when choosing an advisor. This is true among all generations. Other factors include good customer service, quality of advice, and transparencies. So all of these are something to keep in mind when you are trying to reach these potential customers. And when we ask these affluents, what financial companies do they trust more? Many of them list retirement companies. Fidelity comes up uh, clearly as the, the top one, and Vanguard as well. And these are typically companies in which they have a retirement plan due to their employment. In contrast, when we ask non affluence this question, they mainly list banks such as Chase and Capital One. And when we ask those who currently do not use an advisor why they choose not to, the top reason is the expensive cost of advisors. Some also believe they can do a better job themselves, and others, especially Gen Zers, feel their finances just aren't complicated enough. And once again, these are all important factors to consider when, you, when you're when you trying to reach these potential customers. Low costs, the necessity and benefits of these services, and of course, reiterating the point of trust and expertise. And we get to our final section. So thank you so far for your patience. We talked a lot about generational difference in, differences in the previous sections, especially with retirement, but let's dive deeper into how these life stage factor into their financial journey, some of the attitudes. We asked affluence, how will they approach their investments in the coming year? Millennials, to no surprise, will be by far the most aggressive investors. Gen Zs are second, and as affluents get older, when they reach uh, the Gen X age, the boomers and seniors, uh, they have accumulated wealth and most likely have a re good retirement plan already in place. They, they want to play it safe rather than be aggressive. So you see over here on the, oh, the numbers all the way on the right, boomers and seniors, only 3% of them say that they, they plan to be more aggressive in the, in the coming year. And even Gen Xers, only 9% of them plan to be aggressive. <clears throat> and we also talked previously about what will impact affluent finances in 2023, and inflation was the overwhelming concern. This is true among all generations, regardless of age, but less so for younger affluents who are at a point in their life where the salaries are increasing, and while they may be keeping pace with inflation, they will grow as their career advances. On the other hand, older affluents who have already made their money and do not have the benefit of continued salary gains and promotions, see inflation as eating into their wealth in a way that doesn't allow them to recoup lost money. Other concerns could be tied into the effects of inflation, including rising interest rates, a recession, and market volatility. 
And Jesse talked earlier about the coronavirus not really being a factor anymore. That uh, that has declined drastically. Uh, so these are these do not uh, the concern for coronavirus do not make the top list except for Gen Zers. And you see it, the table all the way to the left. About one in five um, Gen Zs still uh, list coronavirus as a concern for their finances in the future. So let's examine the affluent mindset as they progress through life when it comes to investment changes. So we ask an open-ended uh, open question. Please tell us how you plan to approach your finances, investments in the coming year. How, if at all, will your financial strategy change from previous years? So Gen Z are still discovering themselves and don't have a direction financially. This is a pretty funny quote from a 20-year-old female affluent. She's bad with money since she's taken out salary for incentives and needs to get better. So they know that they know they need to get better and get their act together. So this 22 year old wants to save a bit more and would like not to have to worry about money in the future. In fact, four and five Gen Z affluents are savers rather than investors. This is the highest among all generations. Only 48% of boomers and seniors consider themselves to be savers. And with the aggressive approach of millennials, many of them are looking for professional advice. This 30 year old says her strategy will remain the same, but would like someone, perhaps a professional, to start looking at her finances. Some of the millennials have debts to pay, including their home, vehicles, a new car or used car, and student loans, even at a ripe old age of 33, they're still paying off their college, uh, college tuition and, and fees. And in fact, because of these expenses, 45% of affluent millennials say they live paycheck to paycheck. And this is considerably higher than all generations. In contrast, only 7% of boomers say they live paycheck to paycheck. So the older affluents, they're more settled, they're more secure than the, than the younger ones. <clears throat> and saving mentality seems to be a theme across all generations, with inflation once again rearing its ugly head. This affects Gen Xers especially, who are wary of their spending. And keeping with the saving money theme, some Gen Xers are taking full advantage of their employee benefits such as 401k, company stocks, and Roth IRAs. As affluents reach their late 50s, they start to really get their finances in order for retirement. Many are even re retiring early. This is from a 58-year-old a saying that they will retire in, in, in the coming year. And when they reach their 60s and retirement looming, they are in market for new financial advisors. Well, this may be a little, a little shocking uh, when, when, you're, when you're in your 60s, you start to look for advisors, but this may be because many never had an, an advisor that they, uh, never had an advisor before until they truly need one. And with retiring, retirement coming up with a lot of um, excess money coming away, you want to you want to make sure that you, you have the right direction. And then look at those who are retired. With time on their hands, they tend to invest in their homes, buying appliances, doing home remodeling. And as Jesse mentioned, traveling is a, is a, big, um, is a big activity they plan to do. And retirees are playing it safe on investments. They aren't necessarily savers, but they are safe investors. It's about, protect, it's, it's about protection, um, protecting what they, all the wealth that they have built rather than gain. And with that wrapping up, <clears throat> we know that inflation is a clear cut number one financial concern among affluents who has a ripple effect and has a ripple effect into worries about recession, market volatility, and rising interest rates. The direct effect has seen a decrease in affluent net worth. However, optimism about the economy and the Dow Jones rebounding in the last six months speak to a positive financial outlook for 2023. Retirement is coming soon for Gen Xers, so now is the time to start reaching out to them for their retirement planning. 
from the already retired, you can see that they will be adding more financial professionals in retirement. So it's important to get in front of them early to build trust heading into retirement. And with so much economic uncertainty, affluents need financial guidance more than ever. Their financial portfolio suggests they have a lot of investments and could use advice on how to properly allocate their money. They look for companies who've been around and are trusted and word of mouth recommendation and internet research reviews are the top ways to reach them. Convinc convincing them of the value and benefits of, of advisors is critical. When we look at generations, there are clear differences in risk tolerance depending on age and life stage. Younger affluents are more willing to try higher risk investments despite the fact that they live paycheck to paycheck, while older affluents are planning for retirement and playing it safe. Retirees think about maintaining their wealth rather than getting richer and will spend on categories such as travel and improving their homes, among others. And with that, we thank you for your time today. We hope you find this information useful in your business. If there are any questions in the chat box, we'll be happy to answer them personally. So expect an email from us uh, very soon. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great day.